In the previous lecture, we presented Alt's distinction between two forms of law in the Bible, casuistic and apodictic. When Alt examined the ancient Near Eastern law codes, he noted that they almost exclusively follow the casuistic pattern. Here are some examples taken from the beginning of three Mesopotamian law codes. The translation was made by the Assyriologist Martha Roth. If a man dies without male offspring, an unmarried daughter shall be his heir. If a man comes forward to give false testimony in a case, but cannot bring evidence for his accusation, if that case involves a capital offence, that man shall be killed. If a woman should lay a hand upon a man and they prove the charges against her, she shall pay 1,800 shekels of lead. They shall strike her 20 blows with rods. We therefore see that the Mesopotamian legal system is based primarily on casuistic law. Alt concluded that in the Bible, casuistic and apodictic patterns derive from two independent sources. Casuistic law is an ancient Near Eastern inheritance. Apodictic law, in contrast, is an Israelite innovation. Assuming that Alt is right, and that apodictic law was invented by biblical scribes. What is the meaning of this fact? Does it have any significant implications? Many scholars who followed in Alt's footsteps believe it does. The biblical scholar Shalom Paul writes. Though these apodictic formulations deal primarily with moral and religious commandments, the question still remains as to why they are part and parcel of biblical jurisprudence and are noticeably absent from all Mesopotamian corpora. Israelite society was founded on a covenantal agreement based on the will of God, who expressed his demands in covenant law declared publicly to the entire community. By making his will personally and directly known to man, an I-Thou relationship is established which characterizes the unique features of this newly founded nation. Moral and religious prescriptions are directed to each and every member of this nation in categorical imperatives. The constitution for this new polity, i.e. covenant law, incorporates and emphasizes both customary civil law, i.e. casuistic formulations, and moral ethical admonitions, together with religious cultic obligations, i.e. apodictic formulations. However, whereas casuistic law deals with precedent and what is, apodictic commandments express what must and ought to be. It addresses man a priori as to what is right or wrong. It is prescriptive, not descriptive, proscriptive, not retrospective, absolute, not relative, categorically imperative and obligatory, not conditional, subjective and personal, thou shalt, i.e., I thou, not objective and impersonal, if a man, God's will, not man. Its purpose is to shape a society, not to state cases and provide remedies. This articulation of the significance of apodictic law brings us back to the issue of uniqueness. As in the case of Greenberg's studies, here too some scholars regard apodictic law as an original Israelite trademark, a sign of a unique way of thinking about God and men. And, as with Greenberg, this interpretation has been criticized. Against the idea that apodictic law was unknown outside Israel, some scholars argued that Alt's database was too limited. You may remember that a similar argument was used against Greenberg, as we saw in the previous lesson. In the case of Alt, his opponents maintain that while legal literature from the ancient Near East does not employ the apodictic pattern, it occurs extensively in other genres. Thus, for instance, diplomatic contracts between emperors and vassal kings include commands such as, do not do evil against my majesty. Other examples appear in the genre known as wisdom instructions. 
these instructions often take the form of direct apodictic advice. Do not speak arrogantly to your mother. Do not question the words of your God, and so forth. We shall discuss wisdom in the last lesson of our course. Some scholars have suggested that the biblical apodictic pattern was borrowed from one of the genres in which apodictic orders are prevalent. There is no way to prove or disprove this hypothesis. At any rate, even if this type of law originated outside the Bible, its adoption as a legal form in the Bible seems to be significant. It corresponds to the biblical tendency to present God as the source of law, and reflects the biblical idea that law is a direct obligation imposed by God. In this sense, it may be added to the other unique features of biblical law we presented in the previous lesson. Yet, these points of uniqueness should not overshadow the fact that biblical law is an integral part of the general ancient Near Eastern legacy, as we already saw.